from the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars pop culture in the ultimate adventure, life itself, and apparently uh, having scratchy throated voices. I'll talk more about that later. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. <laughs> I'm Ken Neff's like, I wasn't going to say anything off air. I want to hear. <laughs> Me too. I was wondering. I'm like, this voice is a little raspier than normal. And I'm Jennifer Landa. <laughs> Welcome to Force Center. I had a long weekend. Uh, Anyway, today's oh, podcast is <laughs> brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash force center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. This week, we are recommending Dark Disciple and Lots of Rest. Uh, no, Dark Disciple by Christy Golden. To download your free audiobook, you can go to audibletrial.com slash force center. One more time, that's audibletrial.com slash force center for your free audio book. Uh, we also have some just quick programming notes. Uh, if you're watching or listening and you're like, hey, this is their questions episode, but it's Tuesday. What is this madness? Uh, because Bad Batch is uh, now coming out starting this week. We're going to be doing our questions uh, episode on Tuesday and then our Bad Batch report. Uh, we'll be recording on Wednesday. It'll be coming out uh, later on Wednesday, uh, maybe early Thursday. We'll see if the internet upload uh, forces are kind to us. Uh, and then, of course, we have Subjective Wars uh, every Friday, Data Bank Brawl Rewind every Sunday, podcast only, and then Jedi Beat on Monday, which is YouTube only. Uh, Jennifer, Jedi Beat has been released to the world. Can you tell people a little bit uh, a little bit about it? It's so exciting. Yes. So right now it is a five-part series. Every week we are looking at some of the historical aspects, weird aspects of Star Wars, some of the creators, the people behind uh, this wonderful galaxy. And the first episode that's live is all about the behind the scenes of the Mos Eisley Cantina. And that is up on our YouTube channel. It's been a labor of love, and I'm so happy that it's finally here and that you all can see it. <laughs> Thank you to our Patreons, our Patreons, mm -hmm. our patrons who made this possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ken, what was your, uh, we were texting back and forth about, like, well, we knew this would be good, but damn. Uh, yeah. What was your reaction watching it? It You know, so fun, because remember, you know, for those listening, like, we were like, Jen was loading in the file when the strike hit. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. like th yeah. this was hitting, uh, so this is a, a well, but it gave uh, Jen time to maybe go back and rework some things that she wanted. And, and, uh, yeah, Joseph, you're right. Like, I remember this episode, the Jedi beat stuff, the happy beep stuff was always some of my favorite, uh, episodes here on Force Center, but I was blown away, Jen, by what you put together. I really do believe okay. you have a skill, uh, as, 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 as it's, it's a mix of documentary celebration, exploration, investigation. It's a news report. It's a it's a GD news report of Star Wars, and I just was pulled in again. I got to watch it, you know, on my Final Cut Pro, and that's when I was texting both of you, going, ah, "This is damn good." And I'm just mm -hmm. not only really proud of you, but just happy to have it uh, uh, live finally for everyone to see. So, uh, and I've put the call out in the Discord. Uh, we we have a Joseph and I years ago uh, decided we need to work on asking for things more <laughs> more than, and I, I'm asking for y'all if you enjoyed it, not only like and and and. Um, Share the video, but tell tell people. Uh, social media is very fractured, as as uh, Joseph's uh, spoken on before here, and it's hard to get the word out. So if you're on Threads, post it. If you're on Blue Sky, post it. If you're on uh, Twitter X, post it. Instagram, post it. And and uh, we we really want this to, to 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 reach out to the world, and I think Star Wars fans would benefit from it. So uh, long winded answer, Joseph. Uh, that was all the thoughts that rushed in my head when I watched it. I understand. I watched it uh, this morning with my breakfast, and oh, I mean, it it was. Oh, I was saying this to Jennifer before we started recording. I love that it is just told as a narrative, is a specific story of the cantina from conception to filming to questioning to refilming, putting it in that very clear context. There's so many details that we as fans either hear or know or kind of half hear or half forget and, you know, little things like, you know, hey, uh, Greedo in the high heels. Like, I think like a lot of fans know that, but to put it in context and make it a story and a narrative it becomes so much more than the sum of its parts. Like it's fun to watch and go like, oh, this is when my favorite cantina aliens mask got made. But for me sitting here watching it, because you construct it as a narrative, it is also just sort of taken us through George Lucas's adventures too, of all the budget information and uh, the, uh, the commitment that he had as an artist to be like, we have to do this kind of desperate reshoot to make the cantina seem what I wanted it to be. And just that perspective of remembering, like 
this person, George Lucas, was absolutely back against the wall. No money, no time, only a handful of people on board that his vision made any sense. And he was like, I know what this needs <laughs> to reshoot one booth <laughs> on La Brea <laughs> Avenue. Uh, and right. forming that all as a narrative just really makes me appreciate what George Lucas uh, went through and just the filmmaking process and, and the relationship to today. When people hear like, oh, you know, you know, they didn't plan that important scene. They just shot it up against a, <laughs> you know, an alley yeah. wall on a Tuesday with a green screen. Right. This film must be bad. The horrible planning. This is such a, a reminder of this is actually what it does take to make good creative yeah. choices is fighting for it and going back for it and desperate yeah. uh, throws to save the day. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm believing in yourself <laughs> when no one else does. Because, boy, you watch that raw footage and you're like, oh, this is whoo. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah Absolutely. To, to know what it could look like at the end and sound like, yeah, so great. Mm -hmm. So great. Can't wait to see the next episodes of, of Jedi Beat. Thank uh, you. Didn't mean to turn this into Jedi Beat commentary, the follow up <laughs> video, but. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it, 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 we're just, you know, we've been going for 10 years now, but uh, it, Jen, it's always been some of my favorite stuff. And, and like you said earlier, you got a particular set of skills that a, a lot of people just don't have. So happy to shine a spotlight on what's going on there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about 007 Center? I do. This is uh, something I'm also proud uh, about because this is a, a series of movies that we've talked about diving into, but they're outside of Star Wars. And we didn't know how to do that. Uh, and then, well, you know, other center emerged and we started seeing a way forward uh, into other areas. And Joseph and I sat down to begin 007 Center, but it is, is exclusive to Patreon supporters. All levels, you get to get the first episode, uh, which is our dive into 2006 Casino Real. We're looking at all the Daniel Craig Bond films. But if you're not a Patreon supporter, or maybe you don't like Patreon, or maybe, hey, just month to month, uh, not, not something you can do or want to do, we understand. It's for sale in the Patreon shop. Just go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash center, hit the shop tab, and you can get the audio version for $3, the video version uh, for $5. I'm not wearing a tuxedo in it, and I feel I've let some people down, but it's there. And, uh, you know, two and a half hours that I I ended that session, Joseph, I don't know how you felt, I just, I felt jazzed. Dare I say jazzed about our conversation about that film. Uh, like I was film. so excited and I've been stopping myself from, I wanted to just rewatch uh, Quantum of Solace immediately, but it's like, no, mm -hmm. save it. Save it for when we're going to talk about it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yep. thank you to everybody who has uh, said nice things in our Patreon and who has uh, purchased uh, the video uh, or the audio. So thank you very much. Uh, last bit of business on that is uh, we do have a Patreon goal that we're building to. At 400 paid patrons, uh, we're going to do a commentary of a Star Wars film, and patrons are going to be able to vote on what that is. So if you're interested in that, considering becoming a, a Patreon member at, at any amount, uh, as long as it's paid, uh, we're at 395 as of this recording. So we're very close to that goal. I'm looking at a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. And, uh, oh, there is one more thing. We have a live stream this Friday, right, Ken? Yeah, yes, we do. Uh, yes, uh, this Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, we're going live. And, uh, you know, it's a post-Bad Batch Season 3 debut and premiere. So we really want your questions and thoughts and opinions and predictions about Bad Batch going forward. Uh, and it's pure with us. We 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 uh, we'll we'll just say we we don't have the screeners. Uh, some people mm -hmm. are very fortunate. We've had them in the past. We didn't get them this round. It's okay. Uh, we'll be uh, watching and uh, guessing with all of you. So this Friday live stream. Uh, come hang out with us and uh, let's talk Bad Batch. And of course, a lot of other things, Star Wars and beyond. Uh, we'll answer those questions uh, too, but uh, hang out this Friday on our YouTube page. Yeah. Uh, we also like to catch up with our life in Star Wars adventures. Jennifer, what were your life in Star Wars adventures besides making the Jedi beat happen? Yeah, that was that was that was basically it. <laughs> that, was it. <laughs> that was it. And I think I, st I stumbled upon some uh, last minute uh, photos and I'm like, oh, I've never seen that one before. How I had not seen that, I felt like I had seen every single photo possible. Yeah, nope. Yeah. Stumbled upon some more. And I'm just like, this is just the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> it's just really, really amazing. And I I tried. I went up and down La Brea Avenue trying to find the studio where the reshoot happened. <laughs> I believe that it no longer 
exists. I think I well, tried to do as much research online as well. And I even went, I was like, maybe I should just record on La Brea Avenue. And I'm like, <laughs> no, that's not going to work. <laughs> I'm live at a thing that happened over 40 years ago in a building that probably isn't here anymore, but I'm live. Yeah, Right. Exactly. I'm like, this is, there's no context. This is just weird. So I just went with some uh, old footage that I found. I love that. Probably yeah. like, I'm in front of this Chipotle restaurant inside. I swear. <laughs> exactly. This is where the magic happened. Yeah. Rick Baker. Oh, he's in there eating a burrito right now. Wow. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I just want to – someday my only dream is to see George Lucas in a Sapporo. That's all I want. That's all I want. My dream, too. Maybe that'll be a Patreon goal. Like, if we can raise this much money, we'll go to every Sapporo in California trying to find George Lucas. Uh, Ken, yeah. did you have any adventures in Star Wars or Sabaros this weekend? Uh, unfortunately, no, with the Sabaros. Uh, I had uh, three, and it's a – Three part um, kind of harmony. It's sad, happy, sad, and happy. Um, <laughs> sad part first. I finally I had to make the decision. Uh, partly financial, partly storage, partly I'm just so far behind. I'm buried and overwhelmed. I did cut off my Star Wars comics. Actually, all my comics, Saga, oh. some of the ones I'm reading. I had to head over to my shop, Earth Two and Sherman Oaks, and just say I, I can't do it anymore. I'm tapping out. Um, I'm going to try to pick up pick up the trades. There's other ways to do it. I mm. get it, but um, it's sad. I've been supporting that shop for about ten years. Uh, yeah. and, and I'll be there, but, um, I just looked at my stack of comics and it's not even about the quality. I have some thoughts on some of the stories that are out there now. Maybe they're not for me, but that's not what this is about. I just, I, I can't catch up. I can't catch up. And I had to, I had to kind of face that reality, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Totally understandable. But that's the yep. first beat of your, your <laughs> that, pop song weekend of sad. That is, that is, yep. That is sad. But then happy sad as I've been rewatching Bad Batch. And at the end of season one. It's been a while since I watched the destruction of Camino, and I some of those shots, it's haunting, and I and I got a little teary eyed, and I thought, GD, this is why I love Star Wars, right? When you, you're just, I'm doing work, um, I've got it almost playing in the background, I'm watching, and then I just look up, and I just was kind of moved about that that moment and how this show made me cry for Camino, <laughs> like. What a wonderful, uh, painful, but wonderful thing they did. So that was happy, sad. And the final one, I want to shout out uh, Scotty Jero, uh, Jero of the uh, Bomb Bad Podcast, who is a teacher. And he put together a two-hour presentation. It's a, it's a teaching lesson wow. on midi-chlorians. And it's a labor oh. of love, uh, too. He's been working on it for about four months. And I watched it last night while I was playing some Madden football. And uh, Scotty, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's from his heart. It is an exploration of the ideas of the midi-chlorians and the, the kind of, uh, you know, weirder but very important side of Star Wars. And that made me happy. And also happy because I'm with you all, too. M count is not enough. I want to hear midi chlorians in new Star Wars, <laughs> and uh, but also again we talk about the prequel generation. We're in this era. Twenty five years of Phantom Menace coming in May, and Scotty's part of that generation that was inspired by those films when others told them, "Nope, you shouldn't be." He was, and uh, I, I really uh, respect it. So uh, great stuff, Scotty. Happy, happy news to round up my Star Wars adventures. Yeah, no, no, I haven't had a chance to watch the video. I saw him posting about <laughs> it, and I think like a, a timeline <laughs> uh, video kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and it, I think so often when they get talked about, it's just a sort of discussion rehash of do do you like them, do not, and to, to kind of maybe put a little of that to the side and just dive in on here's what it means is great. Mm. Yeah, no, highly recommend it. The Bomb Bad cast, uh, he and Jerry are, are, are great cats. Um, but I highly recommend the Mini Chlorine Deep Dive. Yeah, cool. but that was my weekend. Joseph, you've got a reveal. You've got oh. to reveal what has happened. I just had a lot of weekend. It just ended up uh, everything piling up at once. And it was a little bit of, uh, uh, luckily not my entire life, but a little bit of this is your life. Um, I haven't had this much social time and been up this late uh, in subsequent days in a long time. Uh, so on Friday, I went to the Doctor Who convention that happens here in Los Angeles, Gallifrey mm -hmm. One. I was only able to be there for a day. Uh, my friend Paul Cornell, who people might know, is a writer of uh, comic books and novels and uh, some great episodes of Doctor Who of the new series. Um, always puts on this just comedy panel that's just totally like absolutely in the weeds Doctor Who jokes. And it's, you know, 18 plus and a little bit naughty and all that. And it was <laughs> great fun. I was out at the Marriott until like the 1 a.m. Uh, and then on Saturday, my friend Bill Corbett came into town and we went to go see a, a theater play uh, that our, our friend James Urbaniak was in and had some nice drinks then. And then uh, yesterday, uh, my friend from Minneapolis, who went to school at 
out in Redlands was in town. So we went to Redlands wow. and hung out with him at various uh, fun Redlands place and then played a, a war game in a in a hotel room until mm. about 1 a.m. <laughs> so it was just wow. like three entirely different things are just also like, well, they all happened on this weekend. So, OK, right. let's go. Uh, so that's my way. Why my voice is a little bit raspy. Raspy. Uh, I think out of all of that, the Star Wars adventure I had was just the um, mm-hmm. the great reminder of how much how important connection is. It's such a theme in Star Wars. It's what the Mindy Clorians are about, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're all connected th- uh, through these things of just having that much social time with that many different people from different parts of my life, uh, and just remembering how important it is to to stay connected in times of yeah. great disconnection. People still coming out of the pandemic, social media being shattered, all those things. It was great to have connection. Here, 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 here. How important. Mm-hmm. Nothing to add to that other than I, I feel you on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. a worth a worthy cause to get a recipe. For. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. fun. I live vicariously really through you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll text the photos next time I'm out and about you. Like, yeah. Look at this. Oh. I'm on the brand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Live. Uh, all right well we have two great questions uh this week uh they are both star wars related and they both uh, i think uh, have us exploring uh, some interesting ideas including some prequel era stuff which i think is going to be happening a lot in this uh this 25th anniversary year for the phantom menace our first question comes to us from andrew mcnab andrew says hello my tongue is partially in cheek here but my question is is yoda all that <laughs> is he deserving <laughs> Of the reverence he has both in (laughs) and out of story. Or is he a dangerous withholder of information whose lies threaten the galaxy? All the while being propped up by strong PR and beautiful music. Hmm. Looking at the the evidence (laughs) in the prequel trilogy, he chairs a council that lets a single, albeit highly intelligent, a Sith rise to power while he continually hedges his bets and just comes across as pretty nonchalant until he beheads some clones. He also turns the heating off in the council chambers to psych out a nine-year-old. <laughs> and then later in life tells that same kid not to mourn or miss a deceased loved one. Wow. Ooh. In the original trilogy, Yoda withholds vital information from Luke to the extent he actually pretends to sleep. Beats the R2-D2 and then hangs back until the snacks get whipped out in Bright Tree Village. This is like just oh total gosh. like old school insult comedy uh, attack on Yoda. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rest, I until the treats rest. come out. <laughs> oh, my God. Respect, not I get. Um, <laughs> uh, Andrew finally says, I'll give him a pass for the sequel trilogy since he seems to acknowledge his yeah. own fault. Uh, Andrew also included some uh, some maybe nefarious hijinks that Yoda gets up to in phase two of the High Republic. Uh, Andrew mm. kindly put a spoiler warning. So I'll be honest, Andrew, I didn't read that part because I'm trying to catch up on uh, phase two of the High Republic and I want to uh, discover for myself <laughs> how Yoda is being naughty yeah. in that mm. era. But this mm. is such a fun question. Obviously, really want to embrace that Andrew starts very clearly tongue partially in cheek here. Uh, definitely some legitimate uh, potential criticisms of Yoda in this, but stated <laughs> in a very funny comedic way. Uh, Jennifer, where do you start with this? Is, is this a hard question for you just to begin with? Of like, yeah. hey, why are we coming at Yoda like this? Or is this like you're in agreement? It, no, I'm not in agreement. It's something I've <laughs> never thought of. Um, no, I, I, you know, and it's just funny if you look at look at it on paper. It's like this is a little green puppet, but it's all you know. He's also a wise, uh, powerful Jedi master. It's absurd. So let's just start there, right? But that that just totally changes everything. If he's withholding this, I think it's like with a parent. Sometimes you got to let the kids figure it out on their own. They need to learn these lessons on their own. He's mm-hmm. not like a god who's going to be a puppet master controlling everything. And some of the people are not on board. And he's like, I have concerns. And they're like, eh. So, you know, uh, and plus it makes a better story. <laughs> right. So, but that's where I start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ken, what's your what's your big picture reaction to this question? I, I, I was laughing here. I was laughing when I read this question in your rundown, Joseph. I, I, Andrew, I don't, tongue in cheek, I, I don't think you're wrong from a certain point of view, which is why I love this kind of Star Wars discussion. Uh, and I'll, I'll push it dangerously close to the real world, oh. where th- for this past week, there's been an interesting discussion to be had about how far do you want to go in criticizing good-intentioned people that are in power who are not perfect. 
and especially compared to m- what might be on the other side. Um, mm. What is valid, what is concerning, and what is pushing too close to making Palpatine seem like the better choice in the next election. <laughs> and it's a valuable discussion to have. Um, and this makes me think of it. I, I, everything, I agree with what you're saying, Jen. Uh, Yoda is not infallible. Um, I, I wanted to have my... I, I saw this and I was like, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and maybe have a list of things like he did do. And, and you know what I said? And as I always do, I'm going to feel it out here. Uh, I, I agree, Jen, that it, it is about Luke's got to figure out some stuff for himself. He's not going to maybe understand. He He's holding that lightsaber up as uh, ready to fight and he's he's not getting it. And he, he might have to be, you know, he might have to face some things for himself to really understand. And maybe all the information at once isn't a good thing. You don't sit your daughter uh, daughters down right now and go, let me... Let me tell you everything about how the world works. Oh, it's, my it's gosh. That's yes, something there. No. Also, I think, uh, and I'll release uh, the, the talking stick here, the talking hammer, but going to the prequel stuff, I, I still think it's an example of, of things were changing rapidly around him. He was understanding it. He was getting it. He was saying there's problems. He's got, you know, mansplaining Keanu Mundy at his side going, things are great. He's got Mace going, I think we should probably go kick some ass. And 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 you don't necessarily have the answers right away is where I'll start. I no, I I really agree with that starting place. I think uh some of these are um these criticisms that Andrew has of our beloved Yoda. <laughs> are uh, <laughs> totally valid. Uh, some of them are, you know, comically <laughs> exaggerated. I'm, I'm going to be yeah. a, I'm going to be a Yoda defender here. I don't think he turned off the heat in the council chambers. No, I don't think he did. Either. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, Anakin came from a warm planet and he felt oh cold. And if anything, hey, everybody on that Jedi Council is old. So if there's any sort of connection <laughs> to the real world, not only is the heating turned up, like to 90 degrees, but like uh-huh. every Jedi in there has like Werther's hard candies in their pockets. <laughs> uh, that would be my guess about the Jedi Council. Anyway, big picture on Yoda. I think um, uh. I think what's wonderful about him is he is uh, absolutely worthy of all of the praise we give him, but he is also flawed. And mm-hmm. some of the praise is even more worthy because he is, uh, I think, a a mentor and a leader who is trying to come at things from the perspective of we can gain wisdom. We can learn from mistakes, but the future is always in motion and we're always just going to be trying our best and we're going to make some mistakes. Yoda included. We see him explicitly makes mistakes, learn from them. Then kind of, Hey, I learned that lesson with Anakin and with the clone Wars. So now I'm, almost going in the other direction with even more caution and fear and anxiety with Luke and, oh, God, will I repeat my mistakes? But I think he uh, continually demonstrates somebody who changes, who is willing to push past his fears, give something a chance, and then is, you know, uh, uh, pleasantly surprised that there is, that he, he's not necessarily right about everything, you know? I think mm-hmm. the, the whole Last Jedi scene... Uh, of mm-hmm. Yoda trying to impart something to Luke that, hey, mistakes are part of what make us. And that that isn't just him going like, yeah, Luke, you effed up. <laughs> Did you learn from it? I think it's Yoda absolutely saying like, hey, remember when I doubted you and you made really, really good choices and made a difference? Like everybody makes mm-hmm. mistakes. It, it's OK. And, and I'm a part of that as well. So I feel like he is flawed and that's part of what makes him so great. I love that Last Jedi moment being brought in as maybe one of the final statements from Yoda uh, on all of Star Wars, right? I know, I know his voice appears, and who knows if we'll get him more down the line. But if that that's kind of, you know, the sound of enlightenment is his theme. Uh, he represents kind of home and security and training and enlightenment. But also what you're saying is he, he doesn't end with, see, just like I told you. He ends with, I, I was wrong too along the way. Mm-hmm. And that's the point. And that's uh, they're going to grow past you as well. And that's part of the change and what we have to do to let go. And I think that's a valuable final lesson. If it is Yoda's final lesson um, to to kind of look back and go, yeah, here's what brought him here. And he has a lot. Of, he's got a lot of successes, Andrew. He's got a lot of successes. Like yep. the back of a baseball card. He's got good stats. Yeah. I want to ask you both about this, too, because I think it's something that maybe people might struggle with, particularly depending on when you met Yoda and from what perspective mm. I met him in Empire Strikes Back and then mm-hmm. you know we used I had years to go like do you think Yoda, Yoda ever had a lightsaber and now like yes on every image of him 
<laughs> he's got his lightsaber out. But right. there is this kind of contrast in that he is extremely kind, funny, lovable, kind of, I think, relatable to children because he's also just like a, a little weirdo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I liked him as a kid. It's like, oh, he's a little weirdo like me. Um, mm -hmm. But then he is also like a pretty deep believer in the Jedi path of sacrifice and Sometimes you you gotta sometimes you gotta let go and do things that you don't want to do. Sometimes you gotta sacrifice. You know, he tells Luke that well, Han and Leia might need to sacrifice themselves for the bigger picture. That's that's too bad. That contrast between this like funny, lovable. He's making jokes. He's telling clones that they're all unique in the Force. But when the time comes, he'll take their head off. <laughs> mm. You know that mm. contrast between if you if you even just like did a smash cut of him in that Clone Wars episode saying mm. you're all unique in the Force to him. You know, yeah. cutting their heads off in <laughs> Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> Jennifer, for you, is that like this character isn't coherent, or is this is a character with contrast? He's fun and lovable, but he's also like a deep, true believer in his in his ways. Yes, I think that's what makes him so powerful. Is he's he's been around the block, he's seen a lot of things, and he knows when he needs to get down to business or be serious and and get the job done, right? I always kind of saw him like a like a grandparent where he's fun, he can have funny moments, and you know that he knows the answer, but he's not gonna give it to you. Mm. And he's gonna make you and you're like, just tell me what to do. Just tell just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And it's like, well. You got to figure this out for yourself. Or like you're saying in, in The Last Jedi, like, yeah, you know, I made mistakes. He's willing to kind of uh, tell us, um, uh, give us guidance in a way that's best learned, right? The mm -hmm. lessons best learned mm -hmm. are, are not taught. And mm -hmm. that's why I always related to him. And I saw, well, my grandparents were not like that. But that's how I saw him, like <laughs> grand grandparent type figure. Yeah, but that sort of teaching mentor advice and style of like kind of point uh, your student toward the door, but yeah. they have to walk through it themselves exactly. in order to learn. Yeah, he's Thanks. definitely got that style. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Ken, how do you wrestle with the sort of the lovable, charming, kind, funny Yoda mm -hmm. with the like, yep, hey, people die. You know, move on. <laughs> a more hardcore Yoda. <laughs> yeah, and we had a we had a great discussion a couple of years ago on that particular moment, right? Did, yeah. you, you and I broke that down. Uh, I can't, don't remember all the words we said, but I, I love um, you talked about when we met him. Uh, for me, Return of the Jedi, really, but but mm -hmm. Empire as well. It's all kind of a mishmash, uh, hodgepodge of one memory, uh, you know, squeezed together there. Uh, I, I, he was lovable. He was funny. He was stealing food. He also scared the hell out of me when he turns to Luke and goes, you will be. like the, So the two sides of Yoda were on display my entire life. Uh, I think I got him. Um, and 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 I, I you know, the, there is another. And he, he was, he was multi-layered from the start for me, whether or not I was fully engaged or not. I didn't see him. You know, because uh, you know this, uh, I, I spent most of the '80s going, "Let Luke run off to Cloud City and be a hero," yeah. because that's what I thought. And and now we've we've had several, you know, deeper discussions on what that means and everything. But in that moment, I was like, "Yoda, buddy, you're wrong. <laughs> like Luke's got to go do what Luke's got to do." And so uh, Luke needed to learn that. I needed to learn that later on, even as a fan of. Oh, there's different ways to approach it. So. Yoda's got he's 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 all around and and I do look up to him and I I do love the character and I do consider him not all knowing but uh, definitely uh, somewhat uh, all understanding in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think in, including his own humanity yeah. or what, whatever he is, <laughs> frogmanity. <laughs> he, he comes from a pod on Yothon, is what we have made up our head canon, whatever that means. Yes. I like uh, it. Yes, yes. A, a tree just opens and a Yoda falls out. <laughs> oh, um, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I walked through a little bit of like the his actual, you know, his life in narrative sequential order. Because I do think that mm -hmm. the prequels mm -hmm. don't belabor it. But I think if we look at like his actions that we do see a change. Um, and I'm curious what, what you both mm. think about it. Like Phantom Menace, yeah. I think he is a little bit more rigid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. He is a little hard on on Anakin, and he lets the rest of the council be hard on this poor kid who misses yeah. his mother. Um, I like to think about it that some of Yoda's attitude in The Phantom Menace is more about Qui-Gon. <laughs> like, mm, Yoda's yes, got a lot yes. on his plate. He's managing everything, and here comes Qui-Gon with, like, the Sith, the Sith is what we should be talking about. Who did you encounter? That's a big problem. And you're like, 
you know, the whole more to say, have you revealed your opinion? Is, it really feels like Anakin yes. is partially yeah. caught in the crossfire of Yoda being like, mm -hmm. God damn, Qui-Gon again. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but I, really I also, also think his wisdom is really, uh, he is delivering it in a harsher way and in a, in a colder way and in a way that feels like you're not being really warm and kind to this scared young child. And I get that criticism. But mm -hmm. his wisdom is so spot on of the fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. You know, mm -hmm. uh, people of our, our era poked fun at that uh, and, mm -hmm. and kind of made early mm -hmm. memes out of that. But it mm -hmm. unlocks so much. It's one of those like basic kind of observations about life that's baked into Star Wars that is just made crystal clear by that line. And, and so I think he deserves some credit, even though he's a little cold in Phantom Menace of like, what he's saying is really, really great. And if Anakin had been able to hear it more, mm -hmm. uh, it might have helped since that is the exact path. That's exactly what happens to Anakin. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great point to find out that uh, they were they were fighting Qui Gon and Yoda, mm -hmm. and, and and that it was like basically like Qui Gon, you've been hitting the the fa the pro prophecies again. You've been taking a hit on prophecies because you seem to be lost in the wilderness, and and yeah. that uh, representing George's big overall take on the Jedi Order that it should not necessarily go away, but what it, what it is now is not what it had be started out as, and, and Yoda was there for so much of that, and so he would represent kind of that like. Uh, we got this. Oh wait, maybe we don't. Oh yeah, we definitely don't. And and that's part of Yoda being a a, a, a character himself, right? He's a mentor yeah. to everyone else, but he's got he, he wakes up every day with aches and pains and wishes and desires and fears, so he's got to deal with it too. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had heard this uh, explanation of it when I first saw the Phantom Menace, because for me, I didn't feel like Yoda. I was like, that's not the Yoda that I that I grew up with. That I know he's so serious. He's not right. He's not as welcoming. <laughs> but I'll relate this to my mother, who was really tough when she when I was growing mm -hmm. up. Really tough on me. The way that she is with my daughters is a different person. They're like Grandma would never <laughs> do that. She's like softened with age, and that's kind of how I maybe see Yoda as we catch him in this moment, right? The Phantom Menace, where he's he's yeah. tough. He's I think tough. so too, and I think that's just part of the reason that I kind of wanted to talk through it in in order of some of the beats that we see of him, because I think that was also a, a prequel talking point. Well, that's not the Yoda I know. And like, well, yeah, it's long before and he hasn't had some of the experiences that shaped him. And, mm. and Jennifer, to your great grandparent analogy is like the Yoda we meet in Empire Strikes Back is like a grandparent who's been in retirement, a rough retirement. And maybe they're living in a cabin out in the woods and kind of disappointed about life, but they've been retired. And that's the, that's the grandparent, you know, and then if, imagine if that's the grandparent, you know, and then you could jump, you know, 30 years earlier and see them at their high stress business meeting. Right. <laughs> they would not be behaving the same. And that's the contrast. He's 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 like the CEO at a board meeting, grandparent <laughs> versus the I'm just building a fire, making you stew out in my cabin in the woods. Grandparent, there's going to be a different vibe. Uh, Very true. This is this is perhaps too real. I, I've shared my story with my grandparents, but yeah, it's me in in the eighties being told, "Kenny, eat 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 your food," and <laughs> flashback to them leaving the USSR with no food on their shelves or in their bags and <laughs> trying to escape uh, Stalin's Russia. Like like yeah, they're not going to be like, "You need to eat because Stalin takes your food." Like they're just like, "Hey, be thankful for what you have." So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then moving on to Attack the Clones, uh, this is some of like top tier Yoda content for me uh, mm -hmm. because I think he is so much more uh, playful. He's kind with the kids. Uh, the the whole scene of yeah. Obi-Wan having this problem of, well, the archive state isn't there and everyone else is being rigid about it. And Yoda is now a little bit, I think, closer to the way we see him in Empire Strikes Back of kind of preaching the, you know, unlearn what you have learned look at it from a different perspective the truly wonderful the mind of a child is is so like well, the answers may be really clear if we're not so uptight if we're not so rigid like i was in the previous movie <laughs> uh yeah. is almost what yoda is saying and, and he does go along with the war he makes that mistake um it, it is his apprentice who fell to the dark side who's doing it and i think yoda feels a responsibility there but but also in that film he knows it's a loss and he's already kind of moving away from the rest of the council so I feel like we're already seeing him grow from a little bit more cold and rigid in Phantom Menace in Attack the Clones. Ken, how do you feel about the difference of uh, of Yoda's there? Absolutely, I think you're, you're tracking what we're, we're we're really trying to get at here, which is the 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 growth, the evolution, the change, uh, the failure forming Yoda. 
as he moves forward. I know Jen being the uh, leader of 1999 is not my Yoda movement. Uh, I, I'm curious to see how you feel about Attack of the Clones, but I, I think the, the the moment with Liam in the shades and all that stuff yep. is a is a powerful moment of enlightenment, especially what, what we've tracked with the Dexter Diner scene and all the stuff uh, packaged around that of Obi-Wan's getting cold, sterile responses from Jedi Order droids and right. analysis. That's one of the big points of going and seeking the comfort and, 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 and true uh, information there from from Dexter and and Yoda is on the way and uh, you're right I, I I love love the final moments in Attack of the Clones with Yoda being like victory <laughs> like, what are you talking about this is a loss <laughs> like I, I I did not spend a lot of time with that in 2002 I spend a lot of time with that now of of, of that's where Yoda is there in that moment yeah yeah realizing like oh man we we spent too long meditating on things thinking about things being really cautious and now yeah. it has escalated to a point that it's gonna be painful no matter what jennifer how do you feel about uh, attack of the clones yoda i really like attack of the young Attack of the Yoda. Attack of the Yoda. I, I like it. <laughs> and I remember being in the theater and feeling like, okay, this is more in line with the Yoda See? than I know. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I love that scene where he he really empowers the kids, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and he doesn't talk down to them. And that's where yeah. I felt like, oh, this is this is my Yoda. Um, I, I had some other issues with Attack of the Clones, but it's actually now one of my favorites. Although I love Reven mm. Revenge of the Sith as well, but yeah, I mm. love I love the, uh, the second one. So there, I don't know. yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that kindness with the kids, and also like the the teasing Obi Wan of losing a planet. And how embarrassing! Mm. How embarrassing. yeah, like, right. is really also being like, hey, look, uh, you know, adults can you know make mistakes too. It's it's so great. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And when he calls the cane back to himself and is uh, pretty uh, pretty sore after his fight with Dooku, is also <laughs> top tier Yoda content. Uh, <laughs> So moving on to Revenge of the Sith, it, it, and one of the other points that uh, that Andrew makes, it, it does seem like you know Yoda is um, aware of his failures by the end of the film. Uh, mm. But Jennifer, how do you feel about the counseling that he gives to Anakin of you know mourn them, uh, do not miss them, do not you know rejoice for those who have passed into the Force? I don't I mean, even this, remember. Yeah. This This is where I'm like, what in the world? Like, how can I not remember? I've seen this movie, I don't know how many <laughs> times. How many times? It's just like, boom, it goes away. It goes away. Uh, remind yeah. me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> talk, it, talk amongst yourselves while I remember. Anakin's <laughs> I having the, the the premonitions about Padme dying in childbirth. And I think oh, it's, yeah. you know, Anakin, Anakin is kind of trying to reach out for help, but not willing to open up and be honest about the whole thing and and i see the scene as yoda trying to be kind of generous because basically anakin's coming to him and saying i'm having visions and and yoda's like yeah they gotta be careful with those and there's also this little dance where he's like uh, where yoda asks him well is this about someone you care about and anakin's mm. like yeah and like <laughs> there isn't a follow-up there of like <laughs> is it obi-wan <laughs> it's a there's a little bit of like maybe some stuff going on with anakin that maybe yoda could have followed up on but i feel like in that moment it's like trying to give you the counseling but i mean he gives him the counseling that i think you know we, we've heard a lot from listeners too who have different strong opinions about it is either it's too cold or it's good advice uh, mm. uh, that yoda is uh basically saying you need to train yourself to let go of people if it is their their time to pass you need to be focused on what what is you know good for them what is right for their life what is natural it's you know he, he calls it the the shadow of greed trying to sort of possess someone. And so mm -hmm. he's kind of, I think he's getting to the heart of what's going on with Anakin of like, yes, of course, none of us want to lose a loved one. But what I'm sensing is you're focused on your pain and how to avoid yes. your yeah. pain as opposed to what's happening with this person. And is it their time? Is it natural? You know, it, and I get it. I, I, my, my take on it is I, his advice is solid and it comes off cold. And I think it's why it doesn't help Anakin. I think if it was a more grandparently, like, yeah, let's talk. What's really going on? Who are you, who who are you in a relationship with? You know, I know mm -hmm. this is really hard. It, it it just it feels a little <laughs> like he's just like, you know, these are the basics. I'm telling you the basics again. You got to let yeah. go of people. You can't be possessive of other people. Yeah, mm, maybe it's frustration. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe he's tired. And he sees, he sees that Anakin really needs that distance. He really needs to cut this off because yeah. otherwise, you know, it's not going to be good. So he's trying to give him the, the hard truth. But yeah. some kids, you need to do it in a gentler way. Anakin is yeah. one of those kids. 
Mm-hmm. Ken, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on on that Revenge of the Sith, Sith monologue? Yeah, we and again, we had a great discussion. On it. I should have listened to it again. I, I can't even remember the good points I thought I made in that episode, but I think it all comes down to to what you're uh, talking about, Joseph, which is, uh, you know, uh, it, there's no part of Yoda that says, yeah, this, you know, losing someone isn't uh, sad, uh, but you are essentially, it's it's uh, what I call this negative attachment, this, this, mm-hmm. this, you, you are, your feelings of loss are in front of their uh, existence, and therefore it can kind of become, uh, if you're not careful, a, a, a trap, and 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 it's going to destroy you. It could eventually destroy them, and and it's not the right way to do it. And you know, we joked during other center, uh, the height of uh, other center was essentially parent center and mom center, and this is something <laughs> I had f- fought with a very over uh, controlling uh, mother growing up, and 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 this scene and our analysis of the scene kind of helped me understand that kind of stuff. So Yoda's saying some. Absolutely spot on stuff, but Anakin has a right to think, man, they 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 treated me a little cold and sterile all the way through this from the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, and and that's part of maybe what Yoda's um, saying, and, and and could factor in a little bit to when he reappears with Luke and is you know, hey, ever thought that you're sometimes a little cold, cold and distant there, old old Master Skywalker? Mm-hmm. And there's different ways to approach it. Uh, I think that all all is kind of in there as well. Yeah, mm. no, absolutely. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, r- rating Yoda's success rate, he doesn't think he, he had a, a really great record here in the prequel era mm-hmm. that um, the failed I have line when he gets in Bale Speeder. Right. I, that's, I think, one of Frank Oz's uh, greatest delivery, the, uh, mm-hmm. the animator's mm-hmm. greatest action. He's stripped of his robe, so he looks kind of like naked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. just yeah. like the failed I have is, is to me is like it isn't just I didn't defeat Sidious. It's. I, yeah. I, I failed entirely across the board. Mm-hmm. Jennifer, how do you take that fail I have? Is that for you like a a big thing? Is that Yoda talking about everything? Y- yeah, I felt very devastating. I, I, <laughs> without the robe, I remember that. Um, yeah, it's just, a, and it's just a sad, sad moment for our hero and somebody that we, I as a child, I was like, you can do no wrong. Mm-hmm. And we really see a very different arc in the prequel trilogy. Um, and mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to watch, right? But it's it's an important story to tell. Yeah. Ken, how do you feel about the failed I have? Uh, it's one of my favorite moments. And I felt in 2005, I kind of was like, oh, Yoda, that's that's self-loathing. <laughs> stop that. <laughs> uh, you stop that. But um, I, I think it's a – I see it as a, as a failed in that moment and, and a fail for the previous, you know, 20 years, 15, 20 years, whatever it is. Uh, it, it all comes crushing down on him in that moment. It, it is that you look back. Sometimes you look back and go, oh, I'm here because of this. Oh, that's great. Life took me where it needs to go. Otherwise, you look back and go, oh, that was that was mistake one. <laughs> that was mistake <laughs> two. And I think it all kind of comes crushing down on him. And therefore, it's one of the more, again, I'll say the term human, but it's one of the more, uh, uh, you know, human, real character moments with Yoda. And I'm with you, too. It's one of the best Frank, Frank Oz deliveries. Yeah, and I think part of the reason I wanted to spend just a moment on it is I totally think he's doing exactly what you're describing, Ken. And much like in Andrew's question, I think Yoda is listed off mistake number one. <laughs> uh, right. I allowed the order to become too rigid. Mistake number two, I, I didn't follow up on the Sith the way that I should have. All the, mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. We all know the failures. But I think that is uh, the the point of the original trilogy is all of his interactions with Luke are about him, to me, processing that failure. Um, he learned his lesson that wars really do not make one great. He always had that attitude, but then he let himself get pulled into Clone Wars and, mm-hmm. and it failed because it was just all it did was uh, feed the dark side uh, from his perspective. Um, yeah. After you spend time with the prequels and everything that Yoda went through, including the advice he gave Anakin that Anakin did not listen to, all of y- all of Yoda's grumpiness and doubt of, you know, I can't teach him, you know, is so understandable and relatable. He has every legitimate reason to go, oh, great, Anakin 2.0. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, same attitude, r- reckless, full of adventure, connected to his friends. Jennifer... Uh, do you process watching like Empire Strikes Back Yoda in the way he handles Luke differently? Would you keep in mind everything that Yoda's actually been through in the prequels? 
Absolutely. Again, I go back to the grandparent thing because when you're a parent and you're in the trenches, you're you're like, don't do this, don't do that. You you're much more rigid. And then mm-hmm. what I've seen with with my mom, it, she's like, oh, she's a free spirit. Oh, she's <laughs> le- I'm like what? Free spirit. <laughs> Right here, <laughs> you know, and because you learn that that life is not going to go, it's it's an improvisation. It's free flowing, mm. and and you learn that the more that you try to control something, the the more bad things can happen. Mm. I really like that perspective because I think what's what's powerful to me about Yoda's choices in the original trilogy and why I think uh, he does deserve the respect that we give him is. He absolutely could have just stuck to his guns and said, no, uh, Luke's Luke's too much like his father. He is just going to make things work. But he's like, all right, I got a lot of concerns, but I'll train him. Oh, he did exactly what I said he was going to do. <laughs> he ran mm-hmm. off. But uh, oh, he, uh, mm-hmm. he he's he, he, Yoda seems proud of Luke when he comes back in Return of the Jedi, mm-hmm. uh, like knowing that he still has farther to go. But like, ah, exactly what you're saying, Jen, life's an improvisation and. I wasn't rigid. I had lots of reasons to be afraid that this wouldn't work, but I let it play out and gave this kid a chance to surprise me. <laughs> He's a free spirit. <laughs> That's Luke Skywalker. <laughs> uh, Ken, how do you feel about Yoda's perspective in the original trilogy when you kind of compare it to what he's actually been through chronologically? Yeah. I think it is, uh, it is the sum of a lot of parts. It is, it is a... Uh, um... Uh, a, a journey that has uh, brought a lot of earned uh, respect and a lot of earned wisdom, and now he's in a troubled time trying to find the best way forward. And and I I'd love, uh, I love, I laughed really hard when Andrew sent this in of just him turning, <laughs> pulling the blanket up and turning and rest, rest. I feel it. Um, I, I I think there's you know Yoda realizes the end is near and and there's a lot of peace there's a, maybe a lot of still frustration ideas but i just love he's a sense he's just got a warmth to him that i've always been mm-hmm. pulled to and i think him you know as luke comes back and is like oops uh, sorry uh that went wrong right and and yoda's not like yeah yeah i, I told you dummy he's just like <laughs> like you said like all right, yeah, but yeah, failure. But you, tomorrow is a new day, and I and I've always taken that to heart from that stuff. So I love Grandpa Yoda. Yeah, I really, really agree with that, and and the way Andrew phrased it is very funny, and I think it's a great thing to That's criticize fair. him for. Of like, yeah, that doesn't seem like we think of Yoda as like wise mentor, not ooh, that makes me uncomfortable. So I'm going to change the subject by literally turning away from you and pulling the yeah. blanket up to my chin. It's very funny <laughs> to look at it from that perspective, but I think what is powerful about it is uh, i think in my mind yoda has held on to this uh mortal plane to have this last conversation with luke i think he's treating luke much more like empire strikes back was like oh you're 18 and you're reckless i know that's just not actual his age but that's the attitude Mm -hmm. of like you're a kid yeah now when he comes back in return jedi there's a little bit of like i can speak to you as an adult and even the turning Mm -hmm. away is it's it's kind and it's like he's feeling for Luke when he turns back mm-hmm. and, and, you know, Luke gets mad and says like, you know, unfortunate that I know the, the truth. And, uh, and you're just like, no, not that not yet ready for the burden. Were you, mm-hmm. that's incredibly mm-hmm. kind. And he's just like, mm-hmm. I got to bounce. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, Luke, you're doing surprisingly well. Yeah. You, you got to face your father, whatever that means. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. And, and I believe in you but I really mm-hmm. feel for you. That whole thing is to me is Yoda actually being extremely warm is yeah. It's cause Yoda yeah. feels bad. To like you to go to the grandparent metaphor again, of like I'm going to give, you know, my grandchild the best advice, but I know they got to go do a really hard thing. And like, mm-hmm. you're going to be wounded. It's going to be hard. And it's hard for me as your grandparent to go. Yep. You got to go run into that fire. Yep. You got to do it. Got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other uh, big Yoda thoughts, Ken? Oh, the, this is also hilarious. I was I, Andrew, very well written. I was laughing all the way through it. I love these kind of Star Wars bar discussions, and I've had them too, especially around 2002, yelling at my friend, the Jedi or the bad guy, you know, and then Star Wars, the conversations, uh, you know, beg you to go a little deeper. But uh, I'll say this. Yoda has never declared all that am I. He has not done that. Everyone else around them has. 
And sometimes we see this example. Sometimes a man with a cowboy hat writes some things you love and everyone, uh, uh, you know, has him ascend to a throne that he might not even want. Uh, I've seen this in executive production, production where I was, uh, me and some guards were told to look at the ground because we're not paying you to look at that artist. The artist didn't say that. The people around uh, the artist said that. So sometimes the hype isn't from the hyped. And mm-hmm. I'm going to give Yoda the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I, I deeply agree. I think to answer Andrew's uh, fundamental question, in my opinion, yes, Yoda deserves the hype because he does make a lot of mistakes. Uh, he is a, like the Jedi. What I like about him is that he is flawed. He does make mistakes, but he keeps striving to learn from his mistakes and be open to different ideas and make a better choice the next time around. And I think that's that's all we can really ask of mentors of like, here's what I learned. Maybe it'll help you. Oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> uh, let me learn and adapt and, and be open to change, you know, even when I'm hundreds of years old. Uh, Jennifer, what are your final Yoda thoughts? I love that from a certain point of view, anyone, even my beloved Yoda, could be a, vill- a villain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's what makes Star Wars so fun is that these characters do have such a long history and you can really pick apart, uh, quite frankly, anything. This was a fun, fun discussion. Yeah. And it makes me want to rewatch the prequel trilogy. I really need to do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Hopefully they'll put them all out in theaters. Uh, well, we are going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with another question back in a moment. And we are back. Uh, We are going to dive into a question from Brian Babcock. Uh, Brian says, hello, Force Center friends. Having just rewatched the prequels for the millionth time, I was curious, before the prequels were made, did you have any thoughts or interpretations of events that happened before A New Hope that the prequels all but nullified? For example, when I was a kid, seeing Vader's helmet removed and seeing just how mutilated he was, I always thought it was the Emperor that did that to him, causing Vader extreme torment, which caused Vader to tap into the dark side and never look back. I never thought he already turned evil before getting put in the suit, and that it was his own friend and master that put him in it. I also thought the Clone Wars had a bunch of different people cloning themselves to fight a war against other people cloning themselves. Uh, Not one guy getting cloned a million times to fight droids. While I love the prequels, I'm sure I'm not alone in having plenty of, that's not how I thought that should have played out feelings as I watched them for the first time. So I was curious if you have any similar memories that stick out in your mind. As always, thanks for reading, and may the Force be with you. Uh, Ken, this is uh, something we've definitely touched on before. Mm-hmm. This is definitely the the long Gen X, and I'm sure other people, but certainly mm-hmm. our generation process of processing the prequels. Where do you go with this? Well, first I'll say during this era post original trilogy, I spent a lot of time wondering about episode six or excuse, episode seven post mm. episode six. Uh, I, I've joked about this, but that's why the expectations of Force Awakens were just uh, almost impossible to to uh, climb over. And I think that's why the film succeeded in my mind in, in that because I, for as soon as uh, you know June 1983. I was uh, like, all right, Han and Leia got me. They have a kid. I'm going to play the kid, and we're going to be on this. And we got to invade Jabba's pal. I had this whole thing, and I, I live near Pismo <laughs> Beach, so we'd go out to the sand dunes, and I either with the, the figures or myself would re- reenact what I had in my head. I, I'm glad it didn't happen. Glad that script didn't get written and made. Um, but that said, as I – I wondered about those stories. Uh, the, the the Return of the Jedi novel has the the you know Vader and Kenobi fighting on a lava planet. So I just I always want to see that. That was part of the joy of Revenge of Sith for me. I was one of the ones that had. I think my vision of the Clone Wars that Kenobi mentioned were probably action wise more in line with the Tartakovsky Clone Wars series. Not that there mm-hmm. wasn't great action in 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 the uh, the the one that came after, of course, on Cartoon Network, but where it was just wall to wall action. I didn't. even conceive politics like what are you talking about what would trade <laughs> federate like and then so that's why in 99 you sit down and you're like no no it's all badass action and i'm not as we, we always have discussion star wars has a place for cool badass action and i always mm-hmm. want it to be there um there's no way i could have anticipated the political side of it um so that i spent a lot of time that and i was in on the theory by early 90s mid 90s stuff and i remember those few articles once even the prequels got announced of well, Clone War, Obi Wan, Obi One Kenobi. So that meant there might be Obi Two Kenobi, Obi Three <laughs> Kenobi, and like that was kind of the thing. And I was in on that kind of stuff, but I just saw it. I didn't see it as as you know separatists and republic. I just saw it as a fight over you know perhaps even cloning. There might have been a, a war of 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 clones on every side. 
the the Obi Wan thing I forgot about that people like right. it, the, and with the spelling being different it's it's so like <laughs> wild conspiracy yeah. theory to me. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, uh, what what was your uh, expectation of the Clone Wars? Then we can get into more stuff. But did what did you think the Clone Wars were? I had no idea. I didn't even, I couldn't even like come up with an idea because I too can. I was so focused on what was happening afterwards. Mm. I was just like, oh, it's all about mm -hmm. what happens next. Um, if I even tried to think about what happened before, I would have envisioned a swashbuckling adventure, like you're saying, wall to wall action, no po idea, politics, no, no, no. And so that's why, me too, when I sat in the Phantom Menace, I'm like, what is mm. this? <laughs> no, yeah. this is yeah. not what I've been waiting for, uh, even though I hadn't envisioned too deeply anything, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I did come in with a lit laundry list, and I know that's right. not what Brian's suggesting, but I just remember thinking, well, that wasn't it. <laughs> no, yeah, that wasn't what I, I would have thought it would have been. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think uh, for me, uh, the Clone Wars thoughts really cemented watching A New Hope on VHS again and again and just getting more and more fascinated by that scene. And like the, you know, the Obi-Wan Kenobi's hut scene for me was like, well, that's the teaser trailer for the prequels. And I'm getting so excited for kind of everything right. that I get out of that, that sense of like, he was a general in the wars and he was best friends with uh anakin and anakin was an amazing pilot and like mm. all that was so so like that's the prequels that's what i'm excited for but the clone wars again and again i think i just assumed maybe somebody on the playground claimed it was true i don't know but i entirely mm. assumed that it was uh, about the morality or legality of cloning like right right mm. i wasn't like well of course it's clones fightings i i was like well half the galaxy wants to clone people and the other half are saying we can't and we're fighting mm -hmm. over that yeah. moral That's, question. Right. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. Had a lot of that feeling, actually. Uh, on, I, yeah, I'd love to go back to those playground conversations where we're sitting there going, all right, here's the, the, the moral dilemma of cloning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the, on the other thing you said um, oh. in terms, uh, Joseph, of things of like, yeah, that, that hut scene, you're right. It is a bit of a, a teaser trailer for, for the prequels if, if you look at it from a certain point of view. And I definitely – had the um, Obi Wan a little bit of how Revenge of the Sith starts might have been what I thought Episode One was going to be right mm -hmm. and and like ah yes. oh, these buddies right. are flying around they're young Anakin uh, and so the decision to start um, young and George has talked about it you know it, it, the studio going you can't have a kid do it and and why I think uh, you know retroactively I look back at Jake Lloyd's performance and 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 he he's so key to the building blocks of Vader. Uh, to come uh, in, mm -hmm. in these little great moments. Talk about Yoda and, and I mean, Cold Sir. It's one of the best prequel lines. And, and, mm -hmm. and as we look 25 years back, let's not forget Jake Lloyd's place. And, and I know we don't hear. So I had a lot of that going in. And so that was the curveball of, you know, even by the, te the teaser poster comes out and it's amazing teaser poster, right? But it's even then it's like, oh, okay, okay. And final, like, um, mm -hmm. I think we talked before, like the way Alec Guinness is, wistfully and you know a little pain looking off when he's talking to luke when he first sees him the, around the tuscans i thought this was 60 years ago mm. and not doing the math of well it can't be more than 19 <laughs> part, right. part of the story <laughs> right well i mean we kind of didn't i think they're i can't remember when lucas said things about the actual timeline uh mm. because yeah. i think i remember being unclear of like well you know exactly when did Anakin fall? Did he already have the kids? Was it before or after they were born? I remember being kind of unclear about all of that yeah. timeline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But still, you know, e as I get older, that one is almost more continues to become more funny to me that it is only the nineteen years. Like because growing <laughs> up, the wait. <laughs> oh yeah. Really funny. Uh, oh yeah. Long time, long time. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? I'm sorry, we're at 2024. Years. So, uh, what is what's not? I'm very tired. What is 19 years ago now? Uh, uh, uh 19 years ago. Okay, what? Uh, 2007, oh, uh, uh, seven, eight, eight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, yeah, around yeah. that, around 2006. I just, I just had a memory of uh, me and Roddy Piper being on stage together. Oh, it was 14 yeah. years, 14 long years ago. So, yeah. right. So 2005. Yeah, 2005 so, right so like yeah. 
uh, imagine you know you're, you're saying like oh it's a long time ago a long time ago remember when uh oceans 12 came out <laughs> a long time ago like from our pop culture memory and life memory particularly as you get older it's it's such a yep. short time to have the the weight mm. behind it and there's all that business about where'd you dig up that fossil and he's like he's so young <laughs> yeah the only thing i can say is that like when i look at pictures of me pr prior to having kids like going going to bars riding bikes doing all this fun <laughs> stuff around los angeles i'm like that's a long time ago <laughs> i was a different person oh yeah my that's God. uh that's yeah. obi-wan's joints talking when he's like that was a long time ago according to my back yeah mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> um an another thing i want to factor in too is uh is is of course perhaps the, the most famous uh change up of lore in canon from George himself is, is Leia and talking about her mother. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, that one I just assumed. Like, well, it was said. She talked, Leia hung out with her. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Leia was there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think it's been answered well enough in, in modern canon and, and whatnot. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, hard, idea hard, that... to, hard to say that one didn't throw me for a loop. Yeah, yeah, the idea that Leia had visions, you know, yeah. of of Padme is is beautiful and great, and I I think fans head canned that, and then it's popped up in various yeah. publishing and all that. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, there's definitely some things where like George is like, no, I'm going to tell him a story the way I want to, um, but the biggest thing for me is I think uh, for me in the prequels everything works from a certain point of view. Uh, but it, but I had all of these assumptions and all of this baggage. It's like a very Star Wars thing of like when I saw the prequels, I had to, you know, uh, unlearn what I had learned. I, you know, I had to look at it with the blast shield down. I had to be open mm -hmm. to maybe mm -hmm. I am being rigid in the way I have decided to see it and realizing all this stuff that I am sort of like pounding the table of, but this is the way it is, was not said. It, I read it between the lines and that's, that's, I think it was a valid interpretation of the original trilogy, but then also there's this great lesson of being open to maybe it's not. And I think for me, those big things were the, it's just the way Obi-Wan talked about, you know, when I first met Anakin, I just mm -hmm. really took the Jedi as totally nomadic of like, you would yes. wander, mm -hmm. you, right. you would maybe yes. be like, I want to become a Jedi. And I've heard that they're on this distant planet. So I'll strike mm -hmm. out and go on this, you know, quest yep. to find one and then i'll wander the galaxy you know helping people and then if i bump into a force sensitive kid i'll decide whether or not i want to train them in the way yep. that you know i thought i could train him as well as yoda it, to me it was, i just had this whole headcanon of like obi-wan was a young man went on a quest found yoda yoda taught him then obi-wan's going around the galaxy he finds anakin like all of that stuff about the way the jedi were that they had this rigid structure and there's a master and a padawan and yoda taught obi-wan because yoda taught every you know uh yeah. uh kid in the in the school in the jedi temple all that stuff that like it, to me it matches perfectly fine yeah the original trilogy now but i had to sort of unlearn what i had assumed about the jedi that was my biggest bump I'm mm. right there with you. Looking back is now I'd refer to them as, as hedge knights, uh, born heavily from the Game of Thrones world of, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, nomadic, traveling the world. And George was like, no, no, it's the, it's the director's guild. That's what they are. <laughs> 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 oh. so, but, but I, but, but I, I, there's a part of that I, that I love. And even in Star Wars Visions, uh, I think they, they tapped into some of that vibe and feeling. And, and I think mm, you could yes. still explore that maybe even going forward. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, a Jedi order in which you could, base a lot of these lessons and stories from is it's still one of my favorite decisions yeah and i mean it, yeah jennifer what were, your, what were your thoughts on did you also think the jedi were kind of nomadic i had never thought about it until you just said that and i, I think that was a big issue for me because going into the prequels as i just said i'm a free spirit mm -hmm. right I, for me all <laughs> these rules all the oh, you got and the, the midichlorians mm -hmm. and the rule the rule i'm like oh how i can't remember all of this <laughs> Mm. <laughs> this doesn't seem like the Star Wars that I knew, going mm -hmm. back to the Yoda thing, which felt very free, free flowing, almost hippie ish, right? Mm -hmm. This was the yeah. total opposite of that and uh, the prequels. Yep. And so I really had a hard time. Now I can appreciate it. Now I understand why those building blocks are important for the rest of the Star Wars stories. But at the time, 
I was just like, no, give me the the hippie, the hippie Jedi that I always <laughs> thought existed. Yeah. And I think for me, that is one of the things that uh, definitely was challenging and I think continues to be a, a conversation among fans who have strong opinions about the maybe the Jedi aren't the heroes. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, it was, I think, and this is my opinion, that Lucas has always thought of the Jedi as heroes, but he treats heroes as flawed. They make mm -hmm. mistakes and they have to correct, like we talked about with Yoda. And I think he went to the prequels with, so like, everybody gets the Jedi are heroes, right? So now I want to tell the story about how a galaxy <laughs> fell. And I'm asking myself, how would hero, how, how could heroes like the Jedi let this happen? What kind of mistake could they lean into? And Lucas, with all of his, you know, running into issues with the director's guild, running into mm -hmm. the issues with the rigidness of Hollywood, it needs to be structured mm -hmm. exactly this way. He has this huge, on one side, huge belief in community and connection, and we're all in this together. But then organizations mm -hmm. can rot that with rigidity and selfishness and, you know, all, all this thing. So I think he he comes at it, in my mind, from the perspective of everybody understands the Jedi are heroes, so I need a way to show how they could fall. And the way they fall is it would become overly rigid organization that's too into themselves, too cocky, too obsessed with their own rules. That's how these heroes made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the story. And I still want more stories where it's like, the Jedi are just the heroes, period. <laughs> you know, and and yeah. we, we get a lot more of that in, in the High Republic. They, they're they they're mm -hmm. flawed and they're going to make mistakes, but they're the yeah. heroes. Mm. Walking a difficult path. I yeah. love that. I, I, I almost have to just not respond to that because I, I, I that could spawn another hour here. But, you know, the Justice <laughs> for the Jedi, uh, you know, movement here, uh, Force Center, that Joseph, uh, you're the first to say those words here. It, 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 it's, um, it's a fascinating time because I think more fans are aware of their own journeys, their own traumas, their own struggles. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, I, I don't want to say this like like a grumpy jerk. Like, I don't you, you might be assigning some of it to the Jedi and that's there. But mm -hmm. I think you, what you just said about George going, we, we got their heroes, right? So how would heroes fall? Let's analyze that. Let's answer that. Let's discuss that. Uh, it, 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 it does not mean that at some point they haven't done heroic things. It, it, it is the, the multiple truth approach to it. it. It is Yoda being flawed, but also being uh, uh, all that. And, and I, I'm fascinated by it, fascinated by the discussions and fascinated by where people take it. But I do, I do bristle. I, I, I'm getting ready for embracing for impact. I'm so excited for the Acolyte. Um, mm. And it's going to dig into this a bit. Mm -hmm. And it's going to dig into it with Leslie Headland being a prequel kid yeah. mm -hmm. and, and having her own uh, uh, journey and her own, uh, 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 you know, quest to move out from underneath oppressive systems and, and, and systems of harm in her own life. And, and, and I think we're going to have a great analysis of the Jedi Order as they're about to fall. And it's going to spawn some maybe at times uh, uh, spirited discussions about the Jedi and who they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, we, we, I will say this, and we we can move on, so we don't just turn into a Justice for Jedi. I, I also feel strongly that Qui Gon was the like he he wasn't you know a gray Jedi who who you know mm -hmm. was this rogue. He was he was staying kind of true to the core beliefs that were getting mucked up by the rigidity mm -hmm. of the order. So the, mm -hmm. to me, the whole idea is he's not a, a gray Jedi walking his own path. He is going, these rules are here to keep us in this in this general path. And it is the spirit of the rules that that matter, not the rigidity of them. And so we need to be open to surprises and changes. Prophecies mm -hmm. are dangerous, but I believe this one. So we, we can't be rigid and just say prophecy bad. Mm -hmm. What if this one is true? Let's explore mm -hmm. it. This is a human child. We need to be kind to him. Yes, training him now breaks our rules, but he's here. And we can't ignore him and we need to be kind to him. That all stuff is him staying true to the Jedi mm -hmm. and proving the Jedi are heroes. And it's mm -hmm. it, 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 the, the, the yeah. Jedi aren't villains. Coyote Mundy has a giant <laughs> stick all the way up to his two brains. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> He's a political idealist. <laughs> <laughs> so wrong. So few yeah. scenes. And they're so wrong so many times. Uh, Jennifer, any other uh, thoughts on uh, kind of balancing the, the expectations you had going into the prequels with? Mm. What was there? Brian makes a great point about Vader and Vader's appearance. I'll never forget when I saw Vader's f face for the first time as a child and just being 
terrified by oh, his, yeah. by his oh, appearance. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what the dark side does to you? I don't want to do that. And I, I too believed that it was, well, that maybe it was the emperor, but also just like, these were his, his battle scars, right? Mm -hmm. So when we saw in Revenge of the Sith that he was like a, a younger person, and it, it was so different than what I imagined, but it made so much sense. And that was a moment where I was like, you know what, I'm I'm not George Lucas. I cannot come up with a better a better story or a better ending. And wow, was that powerful. I mean, people, it was like, I remember the theater, there was gasps, but also mm -hmm. some cheers because it was like, yay, we're finally, oh, God, this is painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a mix of emotions. Yeah, I remember being yeah. just uh, both expecting it and also being kind of truly shocked by like the suddenness and the horror of it. I think I always kind yes. of expected like he fell from a high place and yeah. mm, it was like, right. I, I don't know if I really wanted the alternative, like Obi-Wan takes one arm, then 15 <laughs> more minutes of fighting, then a leg, like some like horrible Monty Python sketch of yeah. Anakin yeah. slowly coming apart, you know? Uh, right. Uh, right. I, I love about that too, for Sebastian Shaw, like that was... Oh. That was, uh, you know, there's again the the math uh, doesn't necessarily add up, and George had a chance to revisit. It. But it's it's funny now to be as a kid in 1983 and thinking, look at that old man, and he's just in his early 40s. But that's what you think 40s the 40s are when you're seven years old. <laughs> so true. Oh, yeah, when I was so young, young. It's like, well, it's really sad that Darth Vader died, but he was probably going to go soon anyway. I mean, look how old he is. Like, it's a horrible. Like 97. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, uh, I think that's all great stuff. I didn't. I read the Return of the Jedi novelization when I was a kid, but somewhere along the line, I forgot that the volcano stuff was in there, mm -hmm. and mm. the Darth Vader was scarred by a battle on a volcano planet with his former master Obi Wan Kenobi. Mm. Was on the back of one of the uh, Power of the Force two cards. Oh wow! And, yeah. So, like in the in the late '90s, that was like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember just I couldn't wait when people were down on the prequels, uh, like after Attack of the Clones, and people were like, I don't even know if I'm going to see the third one. I I kept being like, <laughs> but there's going to be a massive lightsaber battle, and it's going to be so cool. It's going to be on a volcano planet. Just give it a chance. Wow. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, this could be just a prequel memory remix here, but yeah, that 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 first teaser trailer when you're seeing the first shots of what we would eventually call Mustafar. Mm. Oh my God. It was like, finally, the prophecy is fulfilled. <laughs> We're going to see this. <laughs> finally, right. Vader's going to get messed up. All right. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Final, final thought for me, we, we really always try to own our perspective of uh, when, uh, when we encountered different Star Wars. And a lot of these are definitely Gen X had time to live with original trilogy thoughts. We mm. love hearing from other people and hearing how, uh, your age and where you first experienced Star Wars informed your uh, opinions. And for me, it's always helpful with my Star Wars fandom to to hear perspectives from other fandoms. Uh, mm. I was just at a Doctor Who convention, and I came into uh, Doctor Who in the in the mid '80s, uh, the Sixth Doctor, Colin Baker, and I love those episodes. And I've slowly learned over time that people who are with Doctor Who much earlier really have problems with those episodes. Uh, those Colin Baker episodes, and now I understand why. But the some of the first fandom conversations I had were people like, "Well, that your favorite episode is awful," and I was like, "What are you talking about? It's the episode uh. that made me fall in love with this show." And it always really helps me to remember that we are we are yeah. very informed by what we encounter first. Hmm. I would love to hear the perspective of those, and it doesn't even have to be assigned to age, but those who saw one, two, and three, and then went, "Great, I have some thoughts about what episode four will be." <laughs> and, right. And, you know, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, Obi-Wan's a liar. <laughs> like that, 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 yeah. Jennifer, any final yeah. thoughts from you? I just I apologize for all the <laughs> drama and negative things I said about the prequels. Fortunately, a lot of it was <laughs> offline to my mm -hmm. fellow my fellow uh Gen Xers. This, yep. this thing sucks. I fell asleep. Like, oh mm -hmm. I feel terrible. I take it all back. I Flame wars words. do not make one great. That's mm -hmm. the truth that we've learned. Uh, mm -hmm. Ken, any final thoughts from you? Uh, no, fun discussion. Great questions today. And uh, now, now I'm lost in my memories of what uh, I used to dream about in the late 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, both for those great questions. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Andrew. Ken, do you want to let people know where they can find us? 
Absolutely. We're on a lot of spots because, well, there's a lot of spots to find everyone these days, <laughs> mostly uh, still on uh, Twitter at Force Center Pod, Threads Force Center Pod. If we'll get the blue sky, we'll get there eventually. Uh, don't worry about that. It's just another login bit of information after we all have to come up with. Uh, Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We're on Instagram as well. Podcast is available in a lot of different spots. Just search, you'll find us. Don't forget, on uh, Sundays right now, we got the Data Bank Rewind, as Joseph mentioned up top. It is podcast only. We're representing to the world our Data Bank Brawl episodes from a long time ago. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash force center. Like, I, I forgot about this one. This t-shirt is canon. Oh, it's still there. Uh, Patreon.com slash force center where you can support us directly. As I said, check out the shop section if you want to uh, just uh, individually purchase uh, the episodes uh, of 4007 Center. Follow me at CatNapsock on my website, CatNapsock.com. I will be in Boston with Mark Ellis first week of April. Official dates uh, are going to be out there. We're going to be on two shows, one with Justin Marino and then one uh, over the weekend, uh, first weekend, the third through the sixth. Uh, information to follow, but... Uh, uh, exciting stuff. Excited to go to Boston. Never been there. That information's coming. Jen, we got the Jedi beat on our YouTube channel, but where else can they find you? Yeah, I want one of those t-shirts. I, I got to get one. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, on Instagram, at Jennifer Landa, TikTok, at Jennifer Landa, 1138. There you go, Joseph. Great job today, as always, sir. Take us home and tell them where they can find you. Oh, thank you, Ken. Uh, you can find me on all the social media at Joseph Scrimshaw is my handle everywhere. I'm particularly enjoying Blue Sky. If people want to give it a chance, please come find me there. Uh, the couple of big things going on right now is the uh, Los Angeles premiere of the short horror film I made with lots of great people. It is called The Nightmare Adorable. It is playing as a part of the Hollywood Real, or Real spelled R-E-E-L, Real Independent Film Festival. And it is uh, premiering this Sunday, February 25th at 2 p.m. Uh, information on all of that is on my website at josephscrimshot.com. So check that out. That is it. We have aid the cues. <laughs>